The Spartan 3s were the first class of Spartans that had augmentations that had a near 100% success rate, and the augmentations themselves were a stark innovation in regards to how the augmentations were administered, whereby the Spartan 2s were heavily surgically augmented, the augmentations of the Spartan 3s were almost entirely injections. For full details on the Spartan 3 augmentations, see my most detailed breakdown of the Spartan 3 augmentations. Today's episode is not a most detailed breakdown, this is instead a continuation of something I started a long time ago with the Spartan 2 augmentations, and that's basically establishing whether or not they are possible. So let's journey together and see if we can find out whether or not the Spartan 3 augmentations are actually possible. Broadly speaking, the Spartan 3 augmentations are broken down into four primary augmentations, all being a chemical-based augmentation. The augmentations are as follows. 8942-LQ99, the carbide ceramic ossification catalyst drug. Skeletons become virtually unbreakable, allowing survival in harder impacts. 88005-MX77, the fibroid muscular protein complex drug. The increased density of an individual's muscles, greatly enhancing physical strength. 88947-OP24, the retina inversion stabilizer drug. Subject's color vision and sharpness is significantly improved and night vision is heightened. 87556-UD61, the improved colloidal neural disunification solution, greatly improves the individual's reaction time, decreasing the time taken to react by 300%. There was for the Gamma Company Spartan 3's one final illegal augmentation, with two additional drugs to be taken intermittently in order to negate the negative side effects of this illegal augmentation, but we'll address that towards the end of this video. Now, the net effect of the carbide ceramic ossification catalyst drug is that the Spartan's bones are significantly increased in their hardness, contrary to the Spartan 2's augmentations where the bones are physically plated with a hardened ceramic material, the Spartan 3 seem to use a catalyst of sorts to facilitate the augmentation using a colloidal carbide ceramic thereafter to plate the bones and allow them to be that much stronger. But is this possible in the real world, or is there at least a near analogue? In a manner of speaking, yes. In modern medicine, a person with osteoporosis can be treated with a supplement like strontium to increase their bone density to avoid the breakage that is associated with the condition. If a person takes a strontium supplement, the body doesn't differentiate between strontium and calcium due to them being very closely related, both being alkaline earth metals and chemical congeners to each other. The consequence is that the body uptakes strontium in the same way it would use calcium for bone growth. On the day to day, your bones experience microfractures due to simply moving around and existing in 1G environments, and a constant process of osteogenesis rebuilds these microfractures and keeps your bones tough. Since strontium is a heavier element than calcium, taking the strontium supplement has a notable increase in your bones density. But we're not talking superhuman levels of strong bones here, we're just talking a, a noteworthy increase in your bone density, not particularly in its strength per se. So how can we get around this? Quite simply, we use the body's processes itself. The process of osteogenesis readily takes up strontium and calcium for bone growth. The process of osteogenesis is driven by the cellular activity of osteoclasts and osteoblasts, Osteoclasts being the cells that actually dissolve old bone material, and osteoblasts deposit new bone material. It is not outside of the boundaries of imagination to use the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technique in order to alter the process of the osteoblasts and osteoclasts to uptake different substances. Although CRISPR-Cas9 is still relatively in its infancy, it is still a massively powerful tool for the editing of genetics. 
and with our rapidly increasing understanding of just what all of the genes in the human genome actually do, it is viable to alter the genetics of the osteoblasts and osteoclasts to use titanium oxide as a basis for bone deposition. Humans do actually consume small amounts of titanium in their average day-to-day -day diet, but because titanium is biologically inert and is not used by the body, we excrete it with no harm done. Altering these cells to use titanium oxide, however, would mean that the titanium in our diet would have to be massively increased and the bones would gradually use the titanium oxide in bone deposition, thereby creating, over time, through the process of osteogenesis, bones laced with titanium. And since this process would have happened organically and over time, the titanium reinforcements would not be cutting off the circulation of blood from the bone marrow out into the body at large. This is our most viable option, however, it's still a way off. Is there something that we could do now that could potentially give us the hardened bones that we're looking for, but without having to wait for the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technique to catch up? Well, again, yes. There's active research in the chemical vapour deposition of boron carbide. Boron carbide is an interesting material because it's the third hardest material known to man. Boron is actually observed of having positive effects on bone mineralization, and being a carbide or a carbon-based ceramic means that this particular material stays in line with the strength requirements we'd need of a Spartan 3 augmentation. Chemical vapour deposition is a deposition method used to produce high-quality, high-performance solid materials where the substrate, in our case the bone, is exposed to one or more volatile precursors which react and or decompose on the bone surface to deposit the required material. Generally speaking, these volatile precursors are chemicals that would react quite aggressively with the body and also generally produce volatile byproducts that have to be removed via a gas flow of some inert gas. These are also often performed at extremely high temperatures. However, there is recent emergent research that demonstrates that boron carbide can go through a process of chemical vapour deposition at normal atmospheric pressures and low temperatures. And in one particular piece of research that I've linked below, the vapour deposition medium is boron chloride 3, carbon hydride 4, and dihydrogen. Now these might sound like relatively scary chemicals to have within your body, but boron and carbon are the two materials that we're trying to deposit on the surface of the bone. The carrier of the carbon is simply hydrogen, and that exists in our body. The catalyzing agent being dihydrogen, again hydrogen exists in our body in abundance. And the carrier agent of the boron is chlorine. Now, yes, your knee-jerk reaction right now might be, hang on, chlorine can't be good for the body, but it's actually a component of all body secretions and excretions resulting from the process of building and breaking down body tissues. Levels of chlorine actually very closely parallel the levels of sodium intake and output of the body, since the primary source of both sodium and chlorine is sodium chloride, or common table salt. So how exactly would this be administered? Well, basically it would be a case of injecting the vapour directly into the body, very close proximity to the bones, and putting a very arguably mild charge through the bones to attract the vapour to the surface. From here it would simply catalyse and go through the process of chemical vapour deposition as is ordained by the very nature of the process, and the byproduct materials would effectively be pumped from the body. Bearing in mind that the byproduct materials are actually materials that we have in our bodies already that our bodies are very effective at filtering out and getting rid of. So viably speaking, that is a way that we could have the reinforced bone injections that these Spartan 3s have. Next we have the fibroid muscular protein complex drug, which increases the density of the person's muscles and massively enhances their physical strength. And again, not a lot has changed here in regards to what I said in whether or not the Spartan 2 augmentations are possible. There is a chemical present in our bodies called myostatin, and this chemical limits muscle growth to a certain size. When this chemical isn't present, as is the case with certain breeds of cow, the result is double the muscle mass, or in cases such as with Eddie Hall, one of the world's strongest men, who has a natural deficiency of myostatin, otherwise known as the Hercules gene, he gets almost a duplication of every single muscle in his body. 
This lack of myostatin is usually bred into animals, but it can obviously happen as just a normal human genetic mutation. However, there is also an inhibitor to the muscle inhibitor called folistatin. With frequent injections of folistatin, you effectively inhibit the muscle inhibitor protein. And then as a consequence, your muscles are unshackled and free to grow up to double their original size. And since the increase of the size of the muscle and the density of the muscle translates to its cross-sectional area, your strength goes up exponentially as well. This is the most viable way to achieve Spartan-like muscle. Next, we have the Retina Inversion Stabilizer drug. Now, this is interesting because, at least by the implication of the name, it has something to do with inverting the retina. Now, there's something very interesting about the human eye in that every rod and cone in the retina of your eye is fed blood. Yet, the capillaries that feed the rods and cones blood actually lay on the surface of the retina. So light that enters the eye and passing through the lens of the eye and then through the intermedial jelly of the eye has to then strike the surface of the retina and pass through blood vessels, through capillaries in order to get to the rods and cones. This is why when you have your photo taken with a flash you get red eye. It's actually the blood in your retinas showing through. Other species of animal don't necessarily have this. In fact, there are some species of animal that have their retinas the other way around. Arguably, at least from an anatomical standpoint, the right way around, where the rods and cones actually face outwards towards the lens of the eye and are fed blood from behind. These creatures also just so happen to have massively increased capability of seeing in the dark. Now, receiving an injection that effectively detaches your retina could just simply result in permanent blindness, and somehow having an injection that can detach your retina and then flip it around the other way is, well, yeah, we don't have that. However, with some gene editing techniques with the CRISPR-Cas9 system, we could in fact give your eye the Tapetum lucidum, which is effectively the eye shine that a lot of different mammals like wolves and cats have within their eyes. It's basically a layer of cells that reflect light much better than the normal tissue of the inside of your eye. And those additional reflections means that you have a boost in your night vision. But in some cases, the focal range and the clarity of your vision can be compromised. So is there an alternative to this? Yes, there is. In development at the moment by a company called Optometrics, they are developing what's called the Bionic Lens, which will replace the organic lens within your eye. It's actually engineered to be optically perfect, and actually allows light to be focused three times more effectively onto the back of your retina than your organic lens, and doesn't deteriorate over time, which basically gives you three times the strength of 2020 vision. Night vision would be possible with the implementation of a nanomaterial onto the surface of those lenses, which would actually allow infrared light and invisible wavelengths of light to be converted to a visible spectrum and then projected through the lens to your retina, granting you in-eye night vision. And yes, this might sound a little out there at the moment, but the surgery that is involved in implanting this optical lens into your eye takes approximately about the same amount of time as laser eye surgery and is practically just as simple. And as for the imager that can pick up infrared light and convert it to the visible spectrum, this has already been demonstrated by a gentleman called Justin Tipping Hall on his TED Talk, which again I will put a link to below. But there you go, with a surgery that takes roughly the same amount of time as laser eye surgery, is practically as simple and costs just about the same, you would then have lenses implanted into your eyes that increase your vision to three times 2020 vision and give you night vision. So we can check that one off the list. We then have the Improved Colloidal Neural Disunification Solution drug, which greatly improves the individual's reaction time, basically increasing your reaction time to 300%. People suffering with conditions such as multiple sclerosis are basically experiencing a condition where their immune systems are attacking the myelin sheaths, the myelin sheaths being the insulative material around the nerves that allow nervous impulses to travel through the nerves at the required velocities. 
with the degradation of these insulative sheaths, the signals don't reach their desired destination and the person experiences gradual degradation of their muscle strength. They'll experience muscle weakness and in worst case scenarios, full paralysis. However, with pioneering research in regards to stem cells harvested from the bone marrow of the person in question, stem cell therapy can be given to multiple sclerosis sufferers to rebuild the myelin sheaths around their nerves through simple stem cell injections at the nerve sites. This restorative, regenerative treatment effectively restores the degraded myelin sheaths for the person while it doesn't necessarily address the actual root issue, which is the immune system attacking the myelin sheaths, it at least restores the myelin sheaths and allows the nervous impulses to actually be received by the required muscles, thereby restoring movement, strength and function to a person suffering from multiple sclerosis. Now, the myelin sheaths do increase the nerve conduction velocity, meaning that the more myelin sheaths you have, the faster the nerve impulse moves down the nerve axons. Giving somebody without a pre-existing condition of their myelin sheaths the stem cell myelin sheath injections would result in a stark increase in the myelin sheaths, the insulative layer around the nerves, leading to a much higher nerve conduction velocity. Those are the four primary augmentations of the Spartan 3s, however the Gamma Company Spartan 3s also received an illegal augmentation that changed their very neural structure. It altered key regions of the individual's frontal lobe to enhance the aggressive response, basically making the animal part of their brain more accessible in times of stress. This leads to instances of hysterical strength and a resistance of going into wide systemic shock. But the thing is, you can achieve something similar to this without altering the neural pathways of your very brain. In truth, many of the characteristic hallmarks of this illegal augmentation bear a striking resemblance to the massive increase in adrenal response that you have in times of fight or flight situations. I think everybody has heard of the stories of, say, a mother lifting a car off of their child who's pinned underneath it in a moment of hysterical strength due to the massive surge of adrenaline that her body would receive in that circumstance. Adrenaline basically removes or massively reduces the tolerance level for your body's own self-imposed limitations to avoid causing yourself serious injury. Our bodies seldom use 100% of our power, speed and strength in normal day-to-day -day life simply because there's no real need for it. And the reality is that we do actually have enough speed and strength to injure ourselves if we're not careful. This final augmentation is very situation specific, only in times of heightened stress. Now if you're going to go into a scenario where you're in a life and death situation and you're in the fight or flight response, your adrenaline is naturally going to kick up anyway and reduce your tolerance for pain, increase your ability to output enormous amounts of force and endurance, as well as staving off the effects of systemic shock. This effect can of course be made more acute by the administration of slightly more adrenaline. Not too much to cross over the edge and put yourself into cardiac arrest, but enough to make the adrenal response all the more acute. And while I wouldn't recommend it, something similar to this can be achieved by using an EpiPen. These contain epinephrine and in some cases norepinephrine, which once administered have powerful effects on the body including increasing your heart rate, your blood sugar level, how hard your heart physically squeezes, and relaxation of smooth muscles in the airways to improve your breathing. And while I can't say much about the non-medical use of EpiPens, everyone knows that getting hit with an adrenaline rush every now and then isn't exactly something that you need to take other drugs to smooth yourself out afterwards. So you don't have to worry about taking the smoothers that the gammas had to take in order to reduce their bipolar integrations and counters any psychological effects of the previous aforementioned augmentation. If you want to learn more about anything that I've highlighted in this episode, you will find links to everything I've discussed in the description down below so you can do a little bit of reading and realise just how viable this kind of stuff is. It just isn't exactly morally or ethically... Mm, acceptable yet, shall we say? But nevertheless, that wasn't the point of this video. The point of this video was to demonstrate whether or not these Spartan 3 augmentations are possible. 
And I think I can say with a pretty high degree of certainty, yes, they damn well are. So, you know, anyone want to have a conversation about perhaps uh, starting to do this? <coughs> I mean, what? Uh, yeah, outro. <laughs>